Hello everyone. Happy Easter to you. It's uh, as far as celebrating, it's the best time of the whole year. <laughs> the time of Christmas is, of course, wonderful because that's uh, Jesus couldn't have died for sins if he hadn't first come into the world. So it's a beautiful time, but he came really uh, to give himself uh, at the time of what we call Easter and to die and to uh, suffer horribly in our place, in my place. I'm so happy about that. And, and then rise from the dead. So hello, Sitio 3 in the Philippines and um, all those other countries I've been naming. And I, uh, from time to time, I'll see a new country there and it makes my heart leap for joy. And I'm happy about that. Here we are again on Sunday night. If you will get your Bibles, um, I want you to be careful to write these verses down because um, what we're going to talk about, uh, it's, it's not an unknown subject at all, but it's, it's pretty deep, pretty interesting. And you write the verses down and you study them later for yourself. They're very interesting, very intriguing. Some of the things that I say uh, will just be me trying to put the picture together as best I can. I mean, it doesn't just say exactly. But, of course, it's based on the scriptures that are exact. So it is the truth that I'm using my words to describe these things as best I understand them. Uh, I've entitled this, God's Mysterious plan. And uh, we're going to start in the book of John, chapter 19. And I need to hasten because there's a lot for me to say. John chapter 19, I'm going to start in verse 12. This is after, uh, if you remember, on uh I guess you would say Thursday night, they arrested Yeshua Jesus and took him to the chief priests and all to be tried and so on and so forth. And then what we call Good Friday, um, of course, he was being tried before Pilate. And, and then during that time, he came before King Herod. It was a long night, a long day, if you will, before they actually crucified him. In John 19, verse 12, it says, And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. <laughs> that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? People always trying to lever people around and force people to do things. You better do this, Pilate, because if you don't, we're going to tell Caesar on you. <laughs> In so many words, you might as well say, Whosoever making himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Notice verse 14, and it was the preparation of the Passover. This is not an accident. The Jews celebrate Passover. And of course, this goes all the way back to in Egypt when uh, they did a Passover meal right the night before they left Egypt. But be that as it may, the Passover mostly was begun in future seeing of coming of Messiah because Messiah was to give his life. And, and it's in the, the scriptures, Isaiah chapter 53, how he suffered and died. And, but anyway, it's no accident that Jesus was, uh, this, this stuff happened at Passover. Jesus could have chosen any day of the year, 365 different days, 
it's not an accident that it happened exactly during this period of time because Jesus Messiah is our Passover. He's the one that was the lamb that was slain for our sins on Passover. It's, it was planned that way by Almighty God. Notice in verse 14 it says, And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. Um, and I studied that a little bit because that's unfamiliar terms with us. The When day breaks, it's hour zero in Hebrew and, and back in those days. And so the sixth hour or, or uh, daybreak would be figured roughly about six o'clock. And so the sixth hour would be roughly at noon, 12 o'clock noon. So this, this here that we're reading this verse or two, it says it was about the sixth hour. It's about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, this is uh, Pilate, said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. What a bunch of hypocrites those people were. They didn't consider Caesar their king. They, they resisted the, the Romans and all that stuff the whole time, continually. They cooperated them, with them just enough to keep the Romans from doing them harm. And for them to say, we don't have any king but Caesar is basically a lie and deep hypocrisy. Verse 16, then delivered he him, that is Christ, Therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with them on either side and Jesus in the midst. Now, if you will, go with me to Matthew 27. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are are all full of, of various details, all of those details being true and not contradictory of anything, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 27, verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. This is kind of... I guess a little bit new to me because um, I was thinking about this sixth hour to the ninth hour. So apparently when Pilate is trying to secure a release of Christ to the priest and to the people was about the sixth hour. And, and it uses the terms in the King James Version about, about the sixth hour. Might have been 530, 545, 550, 6 o'clock about the sixth hour. And it says here in Matthew that um, there was darkness over all the land, starting with the sixth hour. So apparently when, uh, and by the way, this darkness was not necessarily complete darkness, but shadiness, uh, obscure. It, it, this, the sky was bright, shining, and then it all got I think about dusky dark, just before really dark. Dusky, you can just barely see it around. You study it for yourself. That's why I said these things. So I find it fascinating from the time that Pilate's doing this, starting then, it started getting dark. And I'm very sure that everyone... I mean, maybe they'd heard of eclipses of the sun and thought, well, is there an eclipse of the sun? And, well, much more an eclipse, it started getting really dark and stayed that way. I've watched eclipses of the sun before, and they last maybe 
15 minutes or something. Nothing like from the 6th to the ninth hour, from noon till 3 o'clock. The most brightest and hottest parts of the day, if you will. <laughs> it becomes like night, not for 15 minutes, for three hours. And I find it fascinating. Apparently, from the time Pilate's really pressuring them to, to let him release Jesus to them, and they, no, no, crucify him. We want him dead. We want him gone, and about that time, about the sixth hour, it starts getting really dark. Before he died, I'm just going based on what, what the scriptures say. It says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus Christ, this is three hours later, so after he had carried the cross in the, the shady gloominess of the almost dark. And they had nailed him to the cross. And he had suffered for hours, uh, I don't know, a couple hours. I don't know how long it took. But about, again, that term about, the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, this is probably the time that uh, some people talk about that probably is the time that the Heavenly Father turned his back as Christ received <laughs> the sin to the world of body. My sin your sins. Christ felt the weight of our sins. It was very heavy. You and I could not have stood it. And after all he had endured, he suffered our sins being laid upon him, and he felt the heaviness of it. My God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calls for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Basically, his spirit left his body at that point in time. When we die, we are eternal beings, people. We don't just lay down in the dust and that's the end of us. All of that teaching of different religions or atheism or whatever, that's, that's a lie. It's not right. When our body dies, it's just what our spirit lives in. Our spirit and our soul live in our body. And at the point of death, it leaves our body. So at that point in time, uh, Christ, I like how one preacher said it, he dismissed his spirit. The Bible, Christ said, I lay down my life and I take it back again. He dismissed his own spirit. He had gone through the whole passion of suffering in my place, in your place. And he, his spirit left his body. Verse 51 says, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or two, as if the Almighty himself tore it. Rent in two from top to bottom, all the way down. The veil in the temple, uh, before Christ was uh, given for our sins, they would offer sacrifices, and the, the high priest would go in and and offer a sacrifice for the whole nation. And if he didn't do everything just right, he'd die and all. And, and these things happened in the temple. And there was a veil. And no one went in there. But the priest would, would offer a sacrifice once a year. Well, the veil was rent. And there's no more sacrifices for sins. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the final and ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Uh, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. 
<laughs> exclusive claim, which would make everybody mad, and it does make people mad. And you say, Christ is the only way to heaven, and people get mad about that. And they hate Christians for that. By the way, there are some professing Christians that claim that Jesus is the best way to God, and that's a lie from the pit of the hell. The Bible, we talked about lying uh, spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what that is. Jesus is not the best way to heaven. He's the only way. There's no other way. If you don't come through Christ, you won't go to heaven. That's what Christ himself said. Neither he was a truth teller or he is a liar. And I'm here to tell you, he, he's, he is truth. <laughs> he isn't just a truth teller. He is truth. He's the only way to the Father. So here in this passage, he, he dismissed his spirit. The veil was torn in two. Notice, uh, the earth did quake. There was an earthquake, and it says in the rocks, rent or split. Jesus Christ is the creator. The Bible says by him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. <laughs> the, the fact that the Son of God was physically, he didn't die spiritually. His spirit left his body, and that was him. That was him leaving. The Bible says one place that God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's a spirit. When he left his body, he wasn't weird or anything. He was probably more normal than in his body. He took upon himself human flesh so he could suffer in our place. But, but anyway, he rose from the dead. And it also says in verse 52, it's fascinating, the graves were opened. And I don't know if the graves were opened right that moment or more toward when he uh, actually rose from the dead. But this is talking about this whole time period. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Okay, now I want to uh, turn to Ephesians 4, 8. A very, very fascinating passage. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. This, these words are just as accurate as any of the words that Christ spoke himself because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 8, it says, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. If you, re if you want to read, uh, let's see if I can find this, Luke 4, 18. I'm giving you these uh, numbers so that you can study these things for yourself. Luke 4, 18, Christ said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In fact, I want to turn there for just a minute because I can't quote it all. Luke. This was when Christ first started his ministry, at the very first. He says, he, he quoted, this is a, a passage out of Isaiah. I believe chapter 61. Anyway, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Notice this one. To preach deliverance to the captives. And I'll just finish it for the sake of the verse. And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But notice again, to preach deliverance to the captives. What an unusual statement. And here in Ephesians 4, 8, it says, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. This is one of the reasons he came. Okay? And he gave gifts unto men. Notice verse 9. It says, uh, Now that he ascended, 
it, it just talked about him ascend, ascending. It says, what is it? But that he also first descended. So before he ascended, he first descended. The Bible says here, again, I'll give you this passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Study it for yourself. It's kind of a weird passage. Strange. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, down inside in the middle. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Um, if you want to study another passage in Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, and, and there's more of that passage there, but um, when the story about the rich man in Lazarus that we talk about, uh, the Bible says that the angels carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom. That's a strange saying, isn't it? And the rich man died, and lifting up his eyes, being in torments in hell. They both went to the same general area in the heart of the earth. Um, and if you read the whole passage, um, the rich man wanted, he, he could see Lazarus yonder in Abraham's bosom across the way. And he, he said, Father Abraham, could you send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue? And Abraham said, no, no, there's a great gulf fixed between us. And whoever would come from here to there cannot. And whoever would come from there to here cannot. But the place of Abraham's bosom was a place of blessing. It's where people who died doing the best they knew how went. It was before the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We, we said that. No man goes to the Father but by me. No one could go to heaven before Christ died on the cross because he's the only way to the Father. You can't get there otherwise. And so people who died in faith doing the best they knew how, probably many Gentiles, etc., who had never heard of Jesus or maybe even heard of Jews or anything else, they died doing the best they knew how in faith. There's a thing inside of men and women. They know that there's some sort of an obligation in this heaviness of evil and sin. And some people just fulfill the desires of the flesh and just live like the devil. And they went to the place of torments like the rich man did. But Lazarus, he died in faith, doing the best he knew how before the way Jesus came. And so he was, he went there to the place of blessing. And if you also remember the thief on the cross, this is in Luke 20, write it down, Luke 23, 43. Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross after he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And there's Christ suffering in me in your place and had the presence of mine. I love this about him. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Thinking about the man's soul while he's dying on the cross. And so when that thief died, where did he go? To paradise or Abraham's bosom. Same place, the place of blessing. And so, again, here we have it. Uh, Ephesians 4, 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. When Christ cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, his spirit left his body. And let me tell you something, it was a mighty powerful thing. Christ suffered as a human, just like me and you suffer. It was hard. It was difficult. It was so heavy that before the crucifixion, crucifixion Christ said, If it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He suffered like you and I would suffer, only worse, because 
He took on him the sins of the whole world. And as the Lamb of God, like we mentioned, Isaiah chapter 53, as the humble, meek Lamb of God, he died as a final and really the only true sacrifice for your and my sins. The Lamb was slain for me and you. And then, when his spirit left his body, look out, man. He wasn't just laying, his body wasn't just laying dead in the tomb. <laughs> that wasn't what was going on during that. His body was laying there, no doubt. But he, his spirit, when he left his body, he didn't just hope for the best. He knew what was happening. He marched on down into the heart of the earth. And power and victory, although the resurrection hadn't happened yet, it says he preached deliverance to the captives. I take that to mean that he preached himself. This word deliverance, it comes from a Greek word that means freedom. It means pardon. It means deliverance. It means forgiveness. It means liberty. It means remission. <laughs> We talk about remission of sins. So I, I think he had to be preaching himself. The only way to the Father is through the Son. And those people in that place had died in faith, doing the best they knew how. And he preached himself to those people of faith. And every single one of them embraced him as the Savior because that's what people of faith do. And when, when I say people of faith, I don't mean... Well, what faith are you? Are you Islam? Are you Buddhism? Are you Christian? No, 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 no. When I'm talking about faith, I'm talking about faith in the Creator and in His Son, Jesus Christ. Those people died with that kind. Of, they didn't maybe know Him, but they knew that there was something. They knew that there was a God, and they knew that somehow we owe everything to Him, and they died with that kind of a belief, and Christ preached Himself who is all these things, freedom, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, liberty, remission of sins. That's who he is. And of course, all of them accepted that. And here in Ephesians, he led captivity captive on high. He ascended. He basically took the people from Abraham's bosom slash paradise to heaven because now they can go there because he's the way. He himself is the way, and he led them himself. The captives, he led those captives forever to be with the Father, okay? So, it, it, but his body's still laying there in the tomb. Looks like he's dead, right? But according to Ephesians 4, 8, 9, by the word of the Holy Spirit, he is not dead as in ceasing to exist. In Revelation 1, 18, so he preached deliverance to the captives. In Re Revelation 1, 18, write that down. Christ says, I am he that lives and was dead and am alive forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Yes, indeed. And notice this, and have the keys of hell. If you look this word up, hell here, it's Hades. It's the place of the dead. It's not just a place of torment in this word, that particular word there in Revelation 1.18. It's the word Hades. And if you study the word, it's basically a subterranean retreat where people go. Abraham's bosom, paradise. It also included the place of torment, all in the heart of the earth, but the place of torment, those people were not taken to heaven. The Bible speaks future tense of hell being cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And I want no part of that. If I have to suffer greatly here for Christ, so be it. I want to experience eternal life and not the second death. So anyway, apparently, you can use your own thoughts about this, but when Adam and Eve sinned, 
they basically, uh, if you will, turn these over to, from the earth to Satan. They were put in charge of the earth. And so Satan gained uh, death passed upon all men for all of sin, the Bible says. When Adam and Eve sinned, death passed on all men. And apparently Christ walked over into the hell part, the place of suffering part, to what I would assume was Satan's throne, and walked up to him with his hands out. But the keys, he had already paid in full. Christ paid in our place. And he's no longer acting as the lamb, if you will. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan, the keys. And Satan, trembling, you can believe it, trembling, handed the keys of hell. And it says here, uh, the keys of hell and, and the grave. Isn't that what we said? Let's see, Revelation 1.18. The keys of hell and of death. Christ defeated death. And whether he physically took keys or just by reason of everything, either way, he took the keys of hell and death. And he has those. So I'm just going to speculate again. So Christ is down there in the heart of the earth and he's taking captivity captive, and I guess he's starting to lead them toward heaven. It may not happen just like this, but I think that he's coming up out of there, and he tells them all, hey, y'all, he's from the south, you see, y'all, <laughs> the joke, <laughs> y'all wait right here, I'll be right back. <laughs> They're no longer, in my view, in the place of the dead, but they're kind of waiting off to the side. And Christ's spirit goes back into his body. And as we sung in church today, his body began to breathe. <laughs> as he said, I have power to lay my life down, and I have power to take my life back. And his spirit went back into his body, and he rose out of the tomb. Before the tomb was opened, before the stone was rolled away, he rose from the dead. The angel apparently moved the stone out of the way to let people in to see that he wasn't there anymore. Christ rose from the dead, and again, in my view, he says, all right, y'all, come on. <laughs> and he took them to heaven. Now, the sequence may be a little different because he appeared to Mary. He appeared to this one. He appeared to that one and the other one. He did all of that, but he led captivity captive, and he rose from the dead. And let me tell you something, all these people running around trying to destroy Christianity and the kingdom of God and talking badly about Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, and all these things, you know, it's obscure a lot. The power of God, he obscures it a lot, but from time to time he reveals it. And one of these days, he will come back for his bride. He's coming back just as sure as it took a thousand years to fulfill these prophecies in the Holy Bible about Messiah coming. Just as sure as that took place, just that sure, Christ will return again for his church. All the dead in Christ and all the ones that remain alive in Christ and will take them to the Father as well. And he will wreak death and destruction on the earth. And whoever refuses him is going to be part of that death and destruction that's talked about in Revelation. So rejoice, Christian. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Christian, rejoice because we serve a risen Savior. Like I've told numerous people on the internet talking to us, I said, Muhammad is still dead and under that green roof there in Medina, I think it is, in Saudi Arabia, his bones are still in there. They know that. They, they, that's his tomb, and they recognize it. But Christ's tomb is empty, people. It's empty. He lives. He's alive forevermore. And even if you and I have to suffer for him, it's okay. He already suffered in our place. 
And he promised us, he's preparing a place for us eternally. It will happen. You can write it down. I love you. It's uh, good to talk to you again. Happy Easter. And don't forget these things. Study these things and, and get a more clear picture of this yourself. It's really exciting stuff. Almighty God bless you.